Saudi Arabia and Iran resume full-fledged diplomatic relations after a gap of nearly seven years since 2016. What does the exchange of ambassadors mean for the two countries and for peace and cooperation in the region? Russian President Vladimir Putin skipped the BRICS summit and will not be in New Delhi for the G20 heads of government meet either. But he did meet with Turkish leader Recep Tayyip Erdogan this week. What was on the agenda at this meeting? And in a vital court case, the extent to which South Africa was bullied into signing one-sided contracts with Big Pharma to procure the COVID-19 vaccine for its people has come to light. Why is this bullying so alarming and what must governments do to win back sovereignty from big pharmaceutical companies? Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you as it always does from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. Before we begin the show, we ask you to like, subscribe and share and also, don't forget to follow us on the social media platforms of your choice. First up, in a deal several months in the making, Saudi Arabia and Iran have exchanged officially ambassadors for the first time since relations went awry back in 2016, leading to a long-term diplomatic impasse. Now, based on a new understanding that took shape at meetings between the two nations in Beijing in March this year, full ties have been resumed. This means many things for the region, of course, including, most immediately, good news for football fans in the region. Clubs from the two countries, as well as their respective national teams, will now visit each other and play games on the regular home and away basis. These games were, till now, being played at neutral venues. Uh, given the Saudis' major push on uh, the sporting front as a tool of its soft power in the recent past, this means the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, Neymar and Karim Benzema will visit Iran with their respective clubs when the Asian Champions League begins play in the coming weeks. The AFC, which is the, the organization that runs football on the Asian continent on Monday, praised a groundbreaking agreement between Saudi and Iranian football federations. Ronaldo's Al Nasser is scheduled to play continental rivals Persepolis in Tehran on the 19th of September. Dr. Abdul Rahman covers the region for People's Dispatch and joins us now for less of the football, of course, but the more serious details on the deal and the response and the response uh, to skeptics as well. Abdul, good to have you on Daily Debrief. As always, we'll be discussing uh, two important stories with you. First, among those. Uh, of course, is the latest in the rapprochement, the diplomatic re-engagement between the nations of Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, can we view the latest developments, Abdul, as the culmination of a long diplomatic process, uh, some of which of, which, of course, has also been mediated by uh, China? And, and now we see uh, the two countries exchanging uh, ambassadors and hopefully diplomatic, full-fledged diplomatic relations. Uh, well, Siddhan, uh, the significance of this particular event uh, is should not be uh, uh, underestimated. Uh, given the fact that there, there were already speculations in the uh, Western media, in particular, about the sustainability of uh, the rapprochement which was reached in uh, March. Uh, there were claims that this may not last long and there, uh, there is a greater chance that this will break out because of the different outstanding issues, disagreements between both the countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, given the fact that both the countries have been uh, uh, attempting to kind of create uh, a regional, uh, 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 kind of some kind of regional presence for their, them, uh, uh, and uh, were involved in a very competitive uh, uh, geopolitical maneuvering in the larger uh, West Asia or the Arab world. Arab world. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there are possibilities of disagreements, no doubt about it. But the, the resumption of diplomatic relationship and the, uh, they are also joining BRICS together. And there are uh, also uh, the new, there are also speculations that Saudi Arabia may join another group, which is called Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, uh, of which Iran became full-fledged member this year, earlier this year. So given the fact that the, now they are uh, cooperating and sitting together on multiple uh, diplomatic forums, 
uh, international diplomatic forums uh, uh, gives them gives the relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia dis, despite the competition uh, over the uh, regional geopolitics different despite the dis, uh, differences over various uh, smaller issues in Persian Gulf or in uh, in Yemen or in other places despite all those differences because now that they have, they have a full fledged diplomatic relation and they have uh, they are sitting together on multiple forums uh, where the the chances of uh, uh, addressing their uh, grievances politically and through negotiations are much more higher than what was there before uh, this gives uh, uh, a kind of uh, become makes it very significant and very uh, important uh, that now that both the, uh, the relationship between both the countries will be much more sustainable it also uh, 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 creates the possibilities of a larger uh, peace and cooperation in the uh, west asia region in particular uh, uh, because uh, because the the disagreements and the conflict between both these the largest one of the largest economies um, largest military power uh, them being the uh, having the influence across the region uh, if there are there were disagreements and there were no uh, venues uh, for them to have a diplomatic uh, relation diplomatically solve those uh, di disagreements then of course that would have that would lead to different kinds of uh, conflicts and different kinds of which would basically add to the instability in the region so if they are cooperating and if there is a full fledged diplomatic relationship between both the countries this basically gives a greater hope for the larger regional uh, peace and stability and larger uh, 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 avenues for further uh, 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 kind of cooperation and 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 that of course will is good for the region good for the global peace and also basically uh, creates better hopes for a uh, 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 future of uh, uh, the south south cooperation there have of course uh, abdul bin skeptics uh, of this uh, new deal or the new understanding that these two countries have come to uh, particularly those who have their own interests uh, in in the wider region in west asia uh, and and other parts of the world uh, how do you view the longevity of the process that is now uh, sort of well underway and and the understanding that uh, saudi the saudis and the iranians uh, seem to have reached well said dan uh, the diplomatic initiative which was taken uh, in china in march uh, which led to the rapprochement between saudi arabia and iran after a gap of more than 7 years uh, and and kind of uh, kind of created a possibility of rebuilding the relationship between both of them seems to have come to a logical conclusion uh, on tuesday when the ambassadors of each of these countries basically went to their respective embassies uh, in tehran and uh, and and riyadh and uh, which was which were functioning of course which were functioning at least since last last month uh, and uh, kind of uh, kind of resumed the full fledged diplomatic relations uh, uh, one should remember that this is uh, what happened uh, on tuesday is uh, basically a result of a very long uh, process uh, because as as i said before the the agreement a kind of uh, understanding between iran and saudi arabia was reached in march this year and this is uh, september so in between the, there were uh, visits and counter visits of uh, senior diplomats including the foreign minister of iran who visited saudi arabia uh, earlier uh, this month and and uh, all this happened basically there it seems there were both the countries were preparing uh, for a very long term uh, uh, and sustainable relationship and that basically uh, you can say led to this delayed uh, exchange of ambassadors ideally uh, it, it was assumed that immediately after the uh, agreement was signed in march there will be exchange of uh, uh, ambassadors to each other but no it took Uh, almost uh, five months, and and but in these five months, both the countries have basically 
agreed on certain basic uh, principles related to their disagreements on issues in the Persian Gulf or issue, issued in the larger uh, region. In meanwhile, they also have basically come together, uh, uh, joined the BRICS. Uh, they were included as a full-fledged members uh, in the BRICS summit, which happened earlier this month. They also, uh, uh, sorry, earlier uh, last month, uh, they, they have also basically, it seems, though it is not very clear, that there has been some kind of understanding between both the countries related to one of the crucial uh, uh, issues of contention between both of them, which is uh, uh, in Yemen, the war in Yemen. So if you see, it seems that even ever since uh, the, the, the rapprochement happened in March, there, were, there was, there was a, a kind of a solid uh, work going on behind the scene, which ultimately led to the culmination of the resumption of full-fledged diplomatic relations uh, uh, on Tuesday. Right, thanks, Abdul. We'll ask you to stick around for just a minute because we'll be coming back uh, to you to talk about another important international meeting, a bilateral meeting that has taken place. Uh, back with you in a second. After a three-hour-long meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, his Turkish counterpart announced that the all-important Black Sea grain deal is back on the anvil and that the deal can be resumed if Russia's misgivings and reservations are addressed. Erdogan said he was working on a revised plan along with the United Nations and the shortcomings which led to Russia pulling out of the deal in July should be addressed. Abdul is still with us, of course, uh, waiting for us to get back to him. Let's go across for more details. So, uh, Abdul, at a time when sort of conversation and uh, sort of the isolationist approach towards Russia seems to be peaking in the context of the war in Ukraine, uh, we know, of course, that the Black Sea grain deal has also fallen out. Russia has withdrawn from that. Uh, what was the sense that you got from uh, discussions between the two leaders in uh, the Russian resort town of Sochi? Well, Siddhant, on the uh, bilateral front, uh, it seems that despite the fact that Turkey is a NATO member, and has basically uh, uh, willingly or unwillingly has been supporting NATO's actions against Russia. Uh, it seems that there is a, a booming relationship between Turkey uh, and Russia. Uh, uh, and this was reflected in the meeting uh, uh, with Putin as well. Um, in the meeting, Putin agreed to open a new power plant, nuclear power plant in Turkey, uh, which is the second one. Uh, it has also agreed to use, uh, basically, use Turkey's ports and create a regional uh, natural gas hub, uh, basically to export uh, using Turkey, uh, export Russian gas all across the world. And Russia, uh, Turkey is already doing it, but the now it seems there is an attempt to increase the amount uh, of that uh, uh, Russian gas export using the Turkish route. It was also uh, it is very important that both Turkey and Russia uh, have uh, very uh, several uh, fronts uh, uh, on which there is some kind of military uh, uh, kind of engagement and uh, from the opposite side. For example, in, Tur in Libya, there is a uh, presence of the Wagner uh, forces and there is a presence of the Turkish forces there. And there is also uh, uh, Syria where... Uh, Russia uh, is basically helping the Bashar al-Assad government to basically regain the control over the lost territories. And uh, 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 Turkey has been supporting the anti-Assad uh, forces. So during the meeting in Sochi, this, but these uh, issues were also discussed in detail. And uh, it seems that uh, Russia, which has been trying to create some kind of uh, uh, open some kind of negotiation channel between Turkey and Syria so that uh, uh, Turkey withdraws from the Syrian territories it has occupied and there is some kind of uh, uh, end of Turkish support to the anti Bashar al-Assad forces. Um, uh, all these uh, issues were discussed in detail as per the reports, but whether uh, the, the Russian attempt to restart the negotiation between Turkey and Syria will materialize or not, I think we'll have to uh, wait and watch. But of course, there is an increasing Russian uh, attempt to basically end uh, 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 Turkish involvement uh, in war in Syria. And that is one of the major issues which were discussed 
there uh, between uh, in the meeting uh, between Erdogan and um, uh, and Putin. All right, Abdul. Thanks very much for those updates on both those stories, uh, and thanks for continuing uh, your work and coming to us with regular updates on daily debrief. And finally, the Health Justice Initiative, a dedicated health and law initiative in South Africa, won a major victory for pandemic transparency and for the world's understanding of just how all-powerful Big Pharma has become. As part of the information sought by the initiative, the Pretoria High Court ruled in their favour and compelled South Africa's National Department of Health to provide access to the COVID-19 vaccine procurement contracts. These contracts highlight the inequitable, unethical and downright racist way in which pharma companies dealt with the South African demands for COVID-19 vaccines at a time when the world was supposed to be coming together to fight a global health emergency. Jyotsna Singh has been following this critical story. Let's go over to her now for details. Jyotsna, good to have you with us on Daily Debrief uh, this evening. Uh, tell us first about uh, these contracts that have uh, now, or the details uh, of which have now been revealed. Of course, a pretty scathing indictment coming from the AJI, uh, calling it unconscionable, imperial, unethical, uh, revealing sort of the extent to which uh, South Africa was really bullied in the context of these contracts. So, yes, sir, that, that's uh, correct. Uh, so, just uh, to explain in short, Health Justice Initiative, uh, it is a South Africa-based uh, uh, organization. They went to court uh, and asked for the contracts which were signed between the vaccine companies and mm -hmm. the South African government uh, during COVID-19, uh, they asked them basically to be put in public domain. That had not been done. All the contracts across the world were always in secret. Uh, so that was, this was a big thing. And uh, it is good that the government of South Africa actually did not appeal in the Supreme Court and agreed with the High Court's decision. And that is also what HGI notes in their uh, statements. Uh, so, uh, but what it has revealed, of course, there are some certain new things, uh, but what we already knew from certain leaked documents from other countries, say Colombia, Brazil, etc., uh, it confirms that South Africa had to go through the same bullying uh, by the pharmaceutical companies. Mm. For example, uh, a complete uh, indemnity, that is, if anything goes wrong and it involves money, uh, then it is uh, the government which will pay for it and uh, uh, the companies will not pay. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, so all of that we had already known. The way sovereignty of the co countries were uh, questioned. Um, mm -hmm. So but what, so the analysis of HJI regarding the South African contracts, what it shows is uh, for uh, the price difference uh, with uh, of the vaccines, the the way they were sold. And it is really astonishing and unethical uh, that a developing country like, like South Africa had to pay a lot more than actually many developing countries. And it wasn't only the companies from the global north, unfortunately, mm. but Serum Institute of India also did the same thing. And somewhere it is smacks of racism. And that's what activists have been saying for many uh, years now. Uh, so for example, Serum Institute uh, sold its vaccine uh, the cost was 2.5 times more for South Africa than the similar vaccine uh, which was sold by AstraZeneca in the UK. Now, wow. these are different companies, but uh, it both were Oxford vaccines. Mm. So there is no logic to it at all. We, uh, it also shows that J&J's uh, uh, vaccine was sold at 33% more. It also shows that Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was sold for 33% more amount than it was sold to the African Union. Uh, uh, it also shows that JNG actually charged more, uh, 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 a lot more than uh, the price at which JNG vaccine was available in uh, European Union and many other Western nations. Um, so basically, the desperation of the countries, I mean, uh, South Africa had one of the worst uh, COVID outbreaks and it went through really bad stuff throughout, uh, yeah. right? Uh, so the uh, the government was actually very desperate, and all of these contracts were also being signed during the third wave. Of, uh, so, so whatever the price uh, the companies were asking, the South African government had to agree to it, and they really fleeced the uh, 
the government. So that's one thing. Uh, what we also see, uh, which is again really uh, worrisome, is uh, uh, the way any responsibility or any penalty that was waived off for these companies. Uh, again, uh, if you see, uh, the, the government had to pay forty million dollars. Uh, to the company as an advance payment and only 20 million would be returned right. if the vaccines are not delivered. delivered. 20 million even without delivering. And there is no penalty if the vaccine is not delivered, if the vaccine is delivered late in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. And these are the contracts and the terms of contracts uh, which we see. Uh, it, uh, so as yesterday, Fatima Hassan from HJI, she said this is probably the biggest scandal of uh, the century because the companies said the, once the government has bought the vaccine, the government cannot sell it to any other company, uh, any, any other country. The government cannot reroute it for something uh, else or to some other geography. However, the company said that on us, there is no penalty. We can actually give the doses uh, to some other country, divert it, but we cannot be penalized because actually the vaccine during the third wave of South Africa, the doses which were meant for South Africa were diverted to European Union. Uh, and not given to South Africa. But there is no penalty that could be charged if they do not deliver. Um, so, so this is one of the biggest scandals, and I think this yeah, is... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's astounding, uh, Jyotsna, how, how, how this has uh, sort of played out. And like you said, it kind of uh, reiterates some of what we already knew, but now gives concrete evidence to it. In that sense, you would imagine that this, this case uh, would have uh, some significance even outside of the realm of South Africa, of course, and, and not just limited to the COVID-19 pandemic that is sort of now, at least uh, in the past. Tell us a bit more on that. What are the repercussions that are likely to uh, sort of uh, go from here? Uh, yes. Uh, so the court case and uh, the, this uh, uh, judgment, then uh, it, it has a lot of relevance, of course. One, uh, again, it also shows that uh, so the uh, some of these contracts were not even uh, according to the legal, uh, the laws within South Africa, they were according to the Welsh law or the English law, English law. which right. is uh, the governments across the world have to take note of that because mm -hmm. you make laws in your country, which comes through a lot of deliberations and the civil society participates, activists participate. Uh, and then, uh, but a pharmaceutical company from some other country can come in and say that we don't agree with this, you have to work according to some other laws, which will be less uh, pro-people, which will be more anti-people. So that's what has happened. So this is one thing the governments should start to say no to and worldwide should take note of. Mm. Uh, number two, uh, at the moment, uh, the pandemic treaty discussions are happening at the level of global health governance. Uh, and uh, th this should feed into it. We cannot have price differentials like this uh, yeah. when internationally you are trying to deal with a pandemic or any health issue. Um, and um, uh, it, it cannot be so non-transparent. Mm. The contracts cannot be so non-transparent. Uh, that is uh, the other thing. The, of course, the governments have to come together and work on it. Um, uh, also, the, for the activists and civil society across the world, it shows that they should probably also go to court and start demanding more transparency and accountability. There was a transparency resolution at the WHO, which was passed uh, in 2019. 18 or 19 and it should be implemented which would have taken care of some of these things if they had implemented it is uh, a law before the, the covid that was passed at an international right. level so it should be implemented uh, at the earliest uh, apart from that the, for me and for i think largely a lot of health activists the most important thing is it shows how the governments were bullied and the south african minister and ministers of many other uh, uh, countries uh, or developing countries have always said that at that point when the countries asked for something we had to give because we could not choose between people's lives yeah. and uh, uh, as compared to uh, I mean we had to choose people's lives over fighting the pharma 
But the mm. point is, why have we created a scenario where pharma companies have become the private companies or transnational companies have become so All much powerful. more powerful than the government and the governments have to claim their sovereignty back in that nation, uh, sense and not really depend on them. Create your own R&D. The R&D in any case is done by the governments. Yeah, it is yeah. primarily and they spend a lot of money. Yeah. Claim manufacturing, do local production and have your own production companies, uh, which was the case before in many other countries. And uh, that is the only way to go forward. That's what these contracts show. Thank you very much for that uh, very important update, Josna, uh, this afternoon on Daily Debrief. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Daily Debrief. As always, we ask you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories, of course, and all of the other work we do. Don't also forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back with more news and analysis, same time, same place, tomorrow. Until then, thank you very much for watching. As always, stay safe. Goodbye.